on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. If you want to have a career or hobby as an author and you don't have collaborators, then it's not really going to be a profession. And I don't mean a full-time profession, but even a hobby. You need to have that kind of interaction. You need people who will hold you accountable. You need people giving you feedback. You need people who will help you along the way. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers. No more barriers. No one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Yes, hello and welcome to The Self-Publishing Show. It's James Blatch. And Mark Dawson. And here we are again with a fabulous episode with a really useful interview that hopefully is going to change the way that you talk to your readers to help you build engagement and sell books. A really interesting interview coming up in a moment uh, with uh, a free handout as well. But before we're done, let's have a quick catch up of what's going on. Um, so we had Mark Stay last week, uh, the bestseller experiment. And uh, I've been looking around this week about uh, what sort of resources are available for free for authors. And I don't know how often we mention quite a lot of the things that we've made available uh, to people, Mark. So I thought we'd just remind listeners, if you're getting into the world of indie writing or you're um, trying to turn it into something that's going to enable you to quit that train journey into Detroit or uh, Delhi or Melbourne, and uh, it means that you can get up and work in your pants, as Mark and I do, not together, uh, every day, then uh, you need some of these resources. So what have we got, Mark? We have, first of all, I would say the list building course is it's a really good resource, isn't it? It is, yeah. So that's the first course, kind of mini course that I have put together, which is uh, is using Facebook ads to find people who will join your list. And it's been taken now by, I, I have no idea how many people, well north of 20,000, I would have thought, um, and has had some great success stories with people like John Logston, who used it and, and went from seven people to... 27,000 or something like that on, on his list within six or seven weeks. So it, it's, um, it definitely works. Uh, you can, nothing is held back. It's one of those courses you can, you can jump in, you can start to, to run those, um, as yourself and start to build your list. And you can get that, James. Where, where's the link for that? Well, selfpublishingformula.com and you'll see a tab at the top on our website, which is courses. And it's called it's called the list building course. It's in the middle of that. So I think it is selfpublishingformula.com forward slash courses if you want to go straight to that page. And it's called list building for authors. And I've changed the system. I did this last year. So first of all, we updated the course. We update all our courses regularly. And Mark, you slaved over that one to bring it up to date with the changes to the ads manager, etc. Uh, inside uh, Facebook. I also changed the system so that people... I think our mailing list, and this is a bit detailed to do with mailing lists, the sort of thing that is covered in in our courses. But you've got to think about people who come back to you and go off your mailing list and come back on, and they can be tagged in a certain way that means they don't get any of the resources again because they're an existing user. Well, I've changed it slightly now that if you put your email address in there, even if you've had that course in the past, you'll get it delivered to you with an email that says, we know you've had this before, but here it is uh, again because you just asked for it. So everyone will get that, and you can do the up-to-date version of it. I would say that course is a good introduction to the sort of things that occupy your afternoon as a marketer as well. It's a sort of cultural glimpse into that side of being a modern indie writer. Yeah, there's I mean, there's lots of lots of stuff is touched on there, including um, you know how to use the ad, how to use ads to find readers, how to target the ads, what to do with the readers once you find them, all of that kind of stuff. And it is it is fundamental to. Uh, what we do as indie authors so there's there's that which i would I'd strongly recommend you check that out it's been it's done really well the uh, other stuff i would say we've got tons and tons of books some again one on facebook ads uh, amazon ads we've got stuff on insta freebie which is going really well at the moment we're having uh, loads of loads of copies of that have been downloaded so how to use insta, insta freebie for uh, writers uh, there's stuff on um, tips on editing and uh, editing tips that you can in, employ in your writing. And we're just in the process of, of kind of checking out and finalizing a book on the uh, KU or not in KU debate, which is um, is, is always a vexing question. But Very, kind of, uh, Macbeth, no, not Macbeth, ha- Hamiltonian. <laughs> Ma- you mean Machiavellian? Machiavellian. No, I meant Ma- I meant Hamlet. Was it to, to be or not to be? To KU oh, or not I to see. KU? Yes, yes, that's Hamlet, yes. 
to be or not to be. Yeah, exactly. So that one, uh, we're just in the process of finishing that. So that should be out quite soon. And those are all free um, and they're in, they're on the website as well. So you can just grab those and, and, and download book funnel links so you can read them however you like. Um, and we'll have more uh, as we progress through the year, as we as we decide to uh, put more together. So always a good place to check for new stuff. Yeah, and then we keep those up to date as well. And without piling some more work on our colleague, John, it's probably time for Vault Volume 3, is it not? Yes, it is, yeah. So yeah, the, the Vault is a kind of a compendium of the, the wisdom from the podcast. Um, and yes, that's that's again gone down quite well. So certainly worth worth having a look at that one as well. Uh, yes, yeah, so you'll get the books on the resources page under the resources tab at selfpublishingformula.com. There's also a link to some of the actual resources software and stuff that uh, that we recommend and use. And that's changing a little bit at the moment, some new stuff coming on soon. Um, uh, I would also mention webinars. So this is not exact. this is sort of, this is not exactly free because you have to be a Patreon supporter or having uh, purchased one of our courses. But we decided some time ago that anybody had taken that kind of next step in uh, to SPF. And it could be as little as a dollar an episode in terms of Patreon. If you go to patreon.com forward slash SPF podcast, you would be members of the SPF university, which Mark is not. Not a university in case anyone's thinking of suing us. Not a real university. Um, and now this is a place where we dig a little bit deeper and offer free uh very good instruction on a range of subjects and we've covered quite a few things so far the most recent one was the calytics uh deep dive um and uh, we've got some good ones planned for that in the future we do yeah so we've had uh tammy lebrecht on mailing lists we've had adam croft talking about mindset i did the first one on was it amazon ads i can't remember now it was a while ago so we've had four or five of those and they're all available um as, as james says to uh to Patreon subscribers and also to students. And we're, we're going to be having, I think Damon Courtney's going to come on and do something about Book Funnel. Um, Craig Martell, Michael Andale, we think might come on as well. So, and if anyone has got any ideas of people that would be good subjects for that, um, just drop us a line because I'm, I'm happy to reach out and see if we can uh, get some additional people um, on the you know, delivering those webinars because they're, they're fun to do and the ones I've I've been involved with, I've learned a lot. So it's uh, it's definitely worth checking that out as well. Good. There is a lot to learn. I can remember in the early days of me being exposed to this whole world, not knowing a lot of what the terms were, mailing lists and subscribers and conversion percentages and so on. And you can't learn it all in one or two sittings. It is a case of absorbing over a period of time. Uh, so some of these things won't make sense to you to start off with, but you will eventually be a ninja expert. That is the plan, yeah. I mean, you're always learning. I mean, even um, I'm still learning stuff, and I've been doing this for a little while now. So it's there's there's a lot of things that change. So you need to keep on top of that, um, and new opportunities coming around all the time. So you know, when I started doing this, Amazon ads weren't possible, and and now they're they're a fundamental part of of the ecosystem that everyone really needs to be uh, to have a handle on. So yeah, it's it's a pretty good place to make sure that you are um, on the you know on the cutting edge as it were of, of how things are going with the indie space good so there's a, an insight into the free resources available to you in addition to that of course uh, very often on a podcast episode we'll have something that we hand out that goes along with it that you can learn from and that uh, will apply to this episode in a moment as you'll find out but i'm going to mention one more thing uh, before we get to the interview itself which is that our our self-publishing show here has had a little baby oh yes that's that's true yeah so um not sure when when the plan is for the first one to go out, but we we decided to um, put another smaller podcast out, probably going out on Wednesdays, mostly hosted by Young Tom. But although I suspect um, you and I might do the odd one as well, and it's so it's called at the moment anyway, as, as we record this self publishing show extra chapter, which took me about ten seconds to come up with, and what it will be is is an it's another interview show, but shorter with a format so five questions that will be repeated every week and anyone can go on there um so you don't have to be an expert you don't have to be selling and delay quantities of books you could just be starting out and only have sold one book if 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 necessary um and it will be fun we, we want it to you know be something that is a is approachable uh, feels relevant to wherever people are at whatever stage we will have some big sellers on there as well but we also want people who are just getting started and and all their challenges and their hopes and, and what they've learned lessons that they've learned and mistakes that they've made and all of that kind of stuff that we can we can all um 
all learn from from that kind of uh, that kind of content. So, yeah, we think it will go on Wednesdays. When's the first one due, James? Do we know? Well, we we we've been through all the technicals today, and young Tom is ready to go. He's reaching out, as they say, uh, to our first potential guest, um, who I won't name at this second because we don't know if he's said yes yet. J.K. Um, Rowling. Yeah, J.K. Uh, she sold more than one book, I'm sure. Um, Possibly one billion. So we think it's going. to going to be on wednesday and it's going to be uh hosted as a facebook live so that's how it'll originally be recorded it will be recorded live and done live it'll sit there on our facebook page and we'll find ways of, of disseminating it after that so if you go to uh our community group which i believe is spf secret group is it not uh on i think so yeah i think that's where it's going to sit that's going to be its main home but also be podcasted as well It'll be podcasted as well. So we're going to package it up afterwards. Yeah. Podcast it. Do you see how we work here, dear listener? On oh, the yeah. fly. Mark tells me in a conversation on the podcast that we're doing another podcast. Pretty sure I've mentioned that right back at the start. But anyway, let's... Uh... Yeah, but I don't listen that carefully to you. Yeah, so it's in our Facebook group uh, if you want to watch it as a Facebook Live, but we'll also uh, send it out on the usual channels. Right. So you can be on it, we should say. How do you get on it? Well, I would, I would go to the uh, Facebook group and that's where we're going to be looking for people to come on and be a guest on that and be uh, grilled by me or young Tom. Or or email. Um, I'm assuming that this is me speaking on the fly here, but Tom at selfpublishingformula.com would be a pretty no, good No, he place. doesn't have that email address yet. So we oh, should dear. have. We should set that <laughs> up. Should. So I don't know why he doesn't, but at the moment, just email support at selfpublishingformula.com. Yes. Yeah. I think Tom will probably, uh, Tom at or anything at that doesn't exist will go into a pot somewhere that we'll get anyway. But Good. Okay, look, we are talking today about human-centric marketing. What is human-centric marketing? Well, it's, it's less complicated and less airy, um, airy-fairy than it might sound. It's basically about making sure that you have a story to tell even in between writing the stories that you tell. So that in your emails and in your conversations with readers, you give a little bit of yourself up and in return for that, people get to know you and like you and it helps you sell books. Now it sounds like a a fairly simple concept and it is like all the great concepts, quite simple, but a lot of people don't practice it as well as they could do. So we have an expert on the subject today. His name is Dan Blank. Uh, he's written well on the subject. He's actually put together a resource for us to come away with. It's a PDF entitled Five Ways to Immediately Connect with Readers. So five things that you can change about the way that you are dealing with your readers immediately to make a difference and help you sell more books. And you can get that if you go to selfpublishingshow.com forward slash connect. Okay, so let's hear from Dan and then I'll have a human-centric conversation with the automaton Mark afterwards. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Dan, welcome to uh, The Self-Publishing Show. Thank you for having me. I was just admiring the clarity of this signal, considering you're 3,000 miles away in the United States. But you're on the eastern coast, so I guess you're this side. That's the miracle of technology. A short swim away. Uh, Well, look, it's great uh, to have you here. We are going to talk about reader engagement. And um, I was interested in something you you quoted to me, actually, in some of the notes that you sent ahead of the interview to say that um, somebody had quite cleverly, one of your friends had identified Mark Dawson as being the kind of guru of marketing in the indie space. And his view was the next thing you needed was you, was somebody to do that more personal engagement and reader engagement service. now, there's a lot to talk about here. One of them is that some authors, quite a lot of authors, feel uncomfortable perhaps at reaching out to individuals and people and building up those relationships. And, um, and maybe they've chosen being a writer because they don't have to meet so many people. Uh, and other authors don't really know quite where to start. And there are lots of places to start in this. So, so I don't know. I'm kind of in your hands with this, uh, Dan. What, should we talk about the, the general importance of reader engagement first? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I I don't think people choose to be a writer because they don't want to engage. I think they choose because they want to. They have a a story, a message that they 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 feel should be in the world that can change someone's life. So to me, that is inherently a social thing. I I always think of art, and I grew up as an artist. My wife is an artist. I always think of art as complete when it reaches another person. The the author brings half of what they bring, and the Art happens when the other reader brings their life experience. That is the moment. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And it's a long-held philosophy of mine that a 
a work of art is only completed when the viewer of the sculpture, the viewer of the painter, the reader of the book, the viewer of the film completes it in their own mind. Which is why I'm always slightly reticent to listen to an author or a painter explain what the meaning is behind their work because that kind of misses the point. It's the meaning in the person who's receiving it. That's the validity of your work of art. What you set out to do is fine and it's interesting, but the work of art is in the mind of the receiver, I think. The yeah, of it's, it. it's half and half, and I think it's up to the reader, too, if they're interested. It's why we have DVD commentaries. It's why I'm constantly on Netflix watching documentaries about Pink Floyd and Tom Petty and Bruce Springsteen. Is hey, That context we're, is we're interesting. Here. <laughs> I went to Tom, Tom Petty's last ever concert, but uh, that's another story, yeah. Wow. And do you know what? We're going... Yeah, we went to this Hollywood Bowl in Los Angeles a couple of years ago, and it turned out he died four days uh, later. It was so sad. And uh, I've just booked tickets for Billy Joel in New York in July, and I'm really worried for him because <laughs> we've, got, we've got a bad track record uh, at this point. Anyway, yes, yeah, sorry, I, uh, I interrupted you. But uh, yes, yeah, so yeah, yeah, we're interested in the meaning behind uh, yeah. and, and yes, it is great to hear. And I'm a big Pink Floyd fan as well. So to listen to David Gilmore talking about what they were trying to do with Dark Side of the Moon. But I believe very strongly when I listened, what Dark Side of the Moon meant to me when I was 12 years old is, in, is the most valid that work of art gets for me and for that work of art. And that might be different for somebody else. Yes. So when we talk about this idea of marketing that work from a writer's standpoint, I often think about, I try to gear my work towards introverts because what I think is inherently an introvert is someone who values the one-on-one -on -one connection. They value empathy. They value this idea of listening as a part of a process of communicating. And they want it to feel like it's within their control and it's step by step. I think a lot of what we fear is the idea that you are thrust upon a stage you say something, it's it's heard by hundreds of people, you lose control of it, you walk off the stage, you're, you have no idea what connected, why it resonated with anyone, you feel like you flubbed it, whether you did or not, and you basically feel terrified. And I'm like, well, that is terrifying. That's not really what marketing should be when a typical writer is thinking, how do I communicate what I write and how do I connect that in a trusting manner with people? And I think that, that those two things, trust and communication, are probably at the center of what I think is author platform or even the, the basis of marketing. So when you say trust, who's trusting who here? For someone to have you in their life, there has to be an element of trust. And I think that happens on, an, on a very superficial level on someone I follow on Instagram. Um, or someone I follow on YouTube. These are voices I'm bringing in my life. A podcast is the perfect example. They're voices in your head for 30, 40, 50 minutes. And it can also happen on a deeper level. The idea that, oh, how do I get word of mouth marketing going? And someone gives you some spreadsheet. It's got a flow chart and there's all these buttons. And it's like, well, word of mouth marketing is, is about trust. It's this idea of there's an identity built in, the identity of the person saying, I read this book. I thought this book was great. I love this book. I'm putting myself almost at risk to recommend this to you, but it's a trust in the work and it's a trust in what that work represents about the person recommending it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I suppose that can be misused a little bit in the same way that you become a bit vulnerable when you say to somebody, I really like this and you can feel a little bit hurt if they said, well, I didn't like it. it happened to me actually last week, a friend of mine, I told him to watch Thoroughbreds, the film, and I saw him last night and he said, yeah, didn't really like it. And and you take it a bit personally, which is silly. And at the same time, there's a whole world of virtue signaling going on now where people will put forward a petition or wear a T-shirt or something to sort of try and validate themselves a little bit. So, but I see what you mean. It's, it's very much you're putting yourself out there one way or another. Well, I think that's a big core of marketing and, and certainly in the modern age in terms of technology, but it's very much about identity. And this is something I hear a lot from authors were saying, I... I used to blog and I used to get all these comments and now no one comments on my blog and they're, they're bitter. And it's like, well, that's because those comments have moved on to individual social media channel. They don't want to be secondary to you where they're commenting in your blog. They want to celebrate who they are and what they love and what they read on their own channel. It's very much about who they are. And as you said, kind of signaling that to other people. And I think that's a lot about identity. It's why, um, you know, you or I didn't feel fearful of saying, oh, I love Tom Petty, I love Pink Floyd. It's sort of, we found a connection in that without meaning to. 
Um, I just got finished doing a, you know, watching a four hour documentary on Tom Petty. So there's a, there is that connection that happens there. And it's that kind of identity. What is, what is liking that kind of music say about you or about me, that sort of thing? Yeah. Okay. And uh, we should say that this is such an important area. Uh, yeah, we talk a lot about the increased competitive, competitive nature of, uh, of writing and authoring and selling books at the moment, the 5 million new works, et cetera, on Kindle. And this engagement, this building up of an audience, it's not just a, a pretty um, after sales tactic. It's about your tribe and people recommending you and becoming your advocates. Is that right? It's funny. I don't see it as competition, although, of, of course, I, I understand and respect the numbers there. Um, what I always wonder at is the access that we have now to reach people directly. I'm, I'll be 46 next year, uh, next month. And I grew up in an era where I grew up as an artist. I was an artist in high school, as an artist in college. I was a writer, a poet, a photographer, all these wacky, artsy things. And all my friends were. And what I found back then was you, it was so hard to get one person to care about what you do, or you'd have your little group and no one outside of that. And I used to manage a cafe. And I'd book performers, I'd book open mic nights, I'd book these artsy things. And if we had like nine or 10 people show up, come into the door, that was a good night. If you had 20 or 30, I mean, they're literally they're flowing onto the pavement outside. What I love about what we have now is, is that you have that access to other people. So I follow a lot of illustrators and artists on Instagram, of, of course, as well as authors. And what I find is it's not really a zero sum game. It's not that I'm saying... Um, just because my kid reads this book and all the friends are reading it. There are so many other ways of finding and discovering, connecting with authors and with books and with people who love reading. Um, so a lot of what I think about is that authors have this opportunity to directly engage 10 people, 100 people, 1,000 people. And the challenge there is they have to do that work, that very human-centered work to... Um, to be active in channels, to be generous in those channels, to be sharing things consistently. And that's something I think a lot about where a lot of people say, oh, I, I had a podcast, it didn't work. And they did two episodes. And I, I, I was blogging for a while, it didn't work. Or I tried Facebook. And you find that they really hoped it was like buying a lottery ticket. And a lot of what I, what I talk to writers about is that idea of really, how do you dedicate yourself to this? How do you actually do it in a way that feels meaningful? But how do you open up that connection? So it's not a competition of there's 10 widgets, someone's only going to buy one. Is it going to be yours? How are you finding more threads to connect with people? Again, I mean, it's a really good example, the music thing with us, which we didn't expect. But I'm like, oh, I have a better sense of, of who you are and of that connection to you because of that. Yeah. Well, I'm 52 tomorrow. So that also explains a little bit of our music taste of the sort of uh, age uh, bracket, which I'm <laughs> going to count myself in the same age bracket as somebody who's 46 next month, by the way. I'm with you. Um, yeah, good. Okay. So you've hinted really at some of the practical steps, i.e. the consistency, uh, the sincerity. Uh, so if we move more practically, uh, what sort of platforms should authors be looking at? And uh, then we can perhaps talk about how they should be using them. So the thing I've been totally obsessed with recently is one-to-one -one outreach, is thinking of the platforms of social media as secondary. These are the context around more direct outreach. So uh, something I work on a lot with writers and something I really research is this idea of emailing people directly or of reusing social media on Instagram. It's not a matter of, do you need to be on Instagram? How do you do it? Like I dig into that a lot and we can happy to talk about it. But how are you using direct messages on Instagram? Are you reaching out specifically? If there's an author you love and they're a midlist author and you want to support them, you want to signal to other people, as you hinted at before, that this is the type of book that you write. Well, there's a real difference between liking something on Facebook, you and 60 other people liked it. Next level, you commented on it. Congratulations. All right, you and 15 other people did that. And then there's something about how can you buy 10 of their books and do a giveaway? How can you create a launch party for them? Like the launch party could be just a, a, you're tweeting about them a lot for a day. How can you make that author's day? How can you signal to other people that you love this book or this is a genre that you love? Um, you're active. You are one of these people they should know. Not by doing anything really outlandish, but really getting very specific about 
who cares about this work? Who are the types of readers? Who are the types of authors? Type of maybe Instagrammers or podcasters or librarians who love these books. And then how can you connect with them in some way that's not just using a platform the way everyone else is? You can definitely use Twitter or Instagram, but I think that the the least crowded channels are the ones that people feel have social risk. So people, I think, are much more comfortable now to get on Facebook. And 10 years ago, they weren't because I couldn't get in when I knew to join Facebook back then. Um, but now there's a little social risk in following someone and liking a post and retweeting it and leaving a review on Goodreads. And I think that when you email someone, when you know you you say, can I interview you? Can I feature you? These things have social risks, so people don't do them, but I think that they're really powerful. So one thing I, I try to have authors do is email an author whose book they loved. And it can be a bestseller, but it's better if they're not like super duper famous, but if they are, that's fine. I can't tell you how many times I ask them to do that and they say, they have nothing but, you know, oh, they're never gonna get back to me, they're too busy, I'm wasting their time, what am I gonna say? The, all the barriers, and they send the email, and a day or two later, they get an email back and the author says something like, you totally made my day. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you loved whatever book. And that reader feels amazing. And it sort of unlocks something. It unlocks the idea that marketing and publishing and readership is very much about those connections. And we can pretend that before social media, that didn't exist. It was just the author writing by themselves in their attic and then the publisher did all the marketing. And it's like, you know, I live in New Jersey. My, my mom grew up in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. My dad grew up in the Bronx, so I'm very New York-centric. And don't tell me that publishing in the 1970s and 1940s wasn't concentric to the social circles that you knew, about who you knew, about lunching, about all the things that didn't happen because we didn't have social media. It's just been updated now. And I think that people have these tools. It's not about should an author use Instagram or Facebook. It's how do you use these tools to connect in a very personal level with readers or with people who will connect you with readers. Let me pick up a couple of those points. So first of all, a little counterintuitive, and you, you hinted at why it was important to do this type of thing, for an author to laud another author and be seen to do so um, because they like them, uh, giving them a lot of publicity and drawing traffic to them. But this goes back to what you were talking about at the beginning, which is the trust, I guess. It's trust. It's also thinking about what kind of life do you want to have as an author? And, and most authors I talk to or I hear from, they'll say something like, ugh, now I have to launch my book or market my book. And it's like, they put it off as long as they can. They're putting on like the full wetsuit to protect themselves from all the bad things. And I try to think about, well, that doesn't sound like much fun. I have plenty of author friends who, they have a whole community of other authors and it feels great. Um, the clearest illustration of this, I would say is, is um, is a promotion I did with author Miranda Beverly Whittemore a few years back where we're going through a book launch with her and we had our spreadsheet and we got to the point where it said, you know, she texted me. She's like, ugh, we're up to the point in the spreadsheet where it says do a giveaway. And she, then she just said all the things she didn't want it to be and she didn't want to do it. And we said, well, how can we make this really great? How can we make it feel generous? How can we want to be a part of it? And what we ended up doing was pulled in a third person who was Julia Fierro, who runs Sacka Street Writers Workshop in Brooklyn. She knows a lot of authors. And what we did was we said, let's find a whole bunch of other authors publishing their book that month who are kind of in the same general field. And let's give their books away. So what we ended up doing was pulling in about 25 other authors. We, we for 30 days, featured an interview with each author. We gave away their book each day for 30 days. We gave away grand prizes. Everyone gets all the signed books with you know, of all the authors. And what we did was we created a program that people wanted to share. Like nobody wants to share that you're giving away a $9 book. That's not some huge thing where, wow, I want to really share this. When you're sharing, you're celebrating 30 other authors, when you're giving away all these books, when, you're, when you are sharing why they wrote those books and who they are. First of all, what author doesn't want to wake up and hear, wait a minute, you're strategizing how you can promote my book? That's an author's dream. It pairs them together so they don't feel lonely anymore. You have 25 people feeling like, oh, I'm not the only one freaking out this month. We're all freaking out. I can support them. And that really spread. I got to talk to people and they're like, oh, that was everywhere. And what it meant was that for Miranda, 
she established closer connections with other people who care about these books. And it just felt great. It felt like it's not just something you're doing for marketing, like you're tricking people, then you run away from it. She still has deep relationships to this day. And it felt like something where, oh, if this is the life of an author, I'm totally good with this. And that was a part of why we would do something like that. Great. And uh, okay, so let's move into uh, the detail again. You talk about that one-on-one contact being the strongest, the direct message. Um, I mean, there's ways of automating direct messaging. Are you talking about that or are you talking literally about either you reaching out to your readers or encouraging, and Mark does this, he encourages his readers as much as possible to email him and message him and he replies to everyone. Is that, that's more what you're talking about. Exactly, yeah. Automation to me is, it's, it, you're missing all the value in automation. One, when people find out about that, they don't feel good about it. But two, a lot of people don't know. They don't know anything about how to talk about, how to communicate about their, their work. And when you talk to just a couple readers even, you're like, oh, that's, that's interesting. They said this or that. That's why they read this kind of book. And you learn how you can talk about your book without feeling spammy. You learn where there's common ground. And this is just a wonderful opportunity. Um, and it's something that I think a lot of people resist because they say, well, I'm, I'm busy. I can't get any more email. What if the email is about your books? What if the email is about topics that you write about that you love? Um, And I find this is an incredible research tool. A lot of people talk about Facebook analytics and Google Insights and all this stuff, which can be useful. But understanding how and why people talk about these things, how you can engage them in conversation, not feel spammy, that is like gold. That's the type of thing that a one-on-one conversation will tell you. And then you can use that for other things down the road. When you say, well, I've got a marketing plan for a book launch. How do we describe the book in this context? What do I do in an interview? I don't want to just talk about the same thing again. Uh, We're going to do this other promotion. How do we talk about that in a different way? You have all that data already because you've had hundreds or, or maybe dozens of conversations along the way. Yeah. So Dan, how do you teach this stuff? You've got um, you've got your own little place uh, on the web. Uh, is this through online courses, books, one-on-one consultation? Yeah. So something I I started WeGrow Media nine years ago, and I started right off with a course, Build Your Author Platform. And a few years back, I told myself that I'm not allowed to do anything that doesn't have one-on-one collaboration with it. So the the ways that I do it always involve me. So. Um, there's the free stuff. I run a podcast. I run a weekly blog. I've had the blog and the newsletter for 14 years. The podcast is weekly. Um, but beyond that, what I do is I try to be involved with it. So I do one-on-one consulting with authors, and that's going to be a very you know high-touch, kind of personalized thing. But then I run these programs. I run a quarterly mastermind group, which is like an accountability group where I'm kind of in there every single day. So in that group, there's a group of 10 other writers in a group. And I'm in there each day, I record an original video for that group. I'm answering their questions. I'm collaborating with them. We're going through a three-month period together to pick a specific goal for each person for that three-month group. And then I've been la- I launched a program recently called Human-Centered Marketing for Introverted Writers. And that's more like a course, although I don't call it that. And that's something where we go through a four-week program. It's focused entirely on action giving you a strategy you can kind of take after the fact, but every week you have a very simple action to take. And then every week I do a personal video for each person in that group. It's usually a 10 to 15 minute video. So you're getting a collaborator in that process. And I tend to find that's what writers need. We're at a point now where there's so many podcasts and blogs and tweets and to-do lists that you could do a thousand things for your life as an author this year and still feel horrible about yourself because you missed another 500. And what I feel a lot of people need is a collaborator and they need someone else to work with, someone to get a read on. They need to meet other authors or someone like myself, someone like you, where they can actually get feedback on it. And I think that just throwing people into a big group and saying, here's a community, ask them questions is very different than having a group of one or three or 10 people that are kind of on your team in that process. So those are the ways I tend to work with writers. Okay, and I think um, you said that you would put together a, a PDF of kind of five steps yep. or something, essential steps. It might be worth it. So I think just because we've talked relatively general, some specifics, but to give some people some takeaways from this this interview to talk through 
those steps. And uh, I should say we'll, we'll set up, um, as usual, we'll set up a, a place where people can download the PDF if we go to selfpublishingshow.com forward slash connect. This seems like a good word, connect. And uh, we'll make sure you get that PDF. So, so takeaways for people, Dan, what are the kind of must do's here? So what I try to think about is a practice that you have, establishing these practices. So one thing I always encourage people to do is take one action per week to reach out to someone who is a reader or, and we'll use the term, it's not a great term, but like an influencer, someone who connects with readers. If you can do one thing a week to send an email, to pick up the phone, to ask someone a question, what that means is that 52 times a year, you're getting some kind of data back about uh, something that relates to your book. And it's ideal if you do it way before you're going through a book launch. Um, so one way to do that is obviously what we talked about already is getting a sense of, uh, well, I guess one thing I have people do is I'll visualize the book launch. Who do you hope talks about this book? What do you hope happens? How many reviews do you hope you have? What do you hope they say? And that lets you visualize, well, if I want 30 reviews in the first month, I guess I better get to know 30 people who read this kind of book. If I want to be interviewed on these podcasts, I, I guess I better start really thinking about this podcast, listening to them, supporting them, maybe reaching out to them, getting on their radar. Um, so it can be very strategic in that manner. So there's plenty of times we'll build a launch plan a year or more ahead of a book. And some of it's just doing that research a lot of people don't do. Uh, another thing is getting really clear about how the marketplace defines your work. So one thing I'll have people do is define their comps by really doing the research. So go to Amazon. Um, a lot of people have no idea where to start with comparable books, but if you can start with one place, Amazon and Goodreads gives you some hints at other books to follow. And then if you can find five or 10 books you think are kind of in the universe, read every single re review for that book. Take note of keywords that come up again and again. Take note of how readers talk about these books. Because suddenly, when you say, well, what's going to go on my website? Why am I doing this now? You have that language. You know how people, what drives them to that book. You start thinking about how they want to talk about these books. So you start building a content strategy for maybe what you share on social media. And again, these things are done when you're a year or more ahead of a book launch, because this is something that you've got to learn over time. Um, and likewise, I think you need to experiment. You need to be putting things out there consistently, not because I think you should take time away from writing or drive yourself crazy. You ha people have assumptions about how a book launch or how marketing works. And most of those times, those assumptions are wrong. It was a good idea. That giveaway was a really good idea, but for some reason, it didn't hit. It didn't scale. Um, and we, we tell ourselves these stories about how vi vir virality works. And I've got actually an example just from this week. I interviewed um, illustrator Rebecca Green for my podcast. As a second interview I did with her, she has a quarter million Instagram followers. And right after the interview, she did an Instagram story. She tagged me, and it was a swipe up to listen to Dan's last podcast with me. And then the next day, she mentioned me again. You know how many new followers I gained on Instagram from that, from a quarter million? I think it was six. And the chance of those six people still following me a month from now, maybe 50%. We tell ourselves that if we do these things by numbers that, well, if I can get you know, half of 1% to her people, then I can convert them and I do this funnel, that this is how it all works. And sometimes it does work that way. And I do plenty of launch strategies with people that do that. But you can't count on that. And the sooner that you have experiences where you're experimenting, kind of like this week, I didn't, I was not interviewing her to do that. And I had no expectation of it, but it was neat to see that actual data and say, huh, I can see an author pin their entire launch strategy on saying, I'm going to be on Mark Dawson's, you know, podcast. And he's got a, and I'll make up numbers here, quarter million downloads. So let's say 5% of those people buy my book and let's say 1% of those people leave a review. And, and then they're, they do that and it's a wonderful experience, but they end up jaded and disappointed because they don't actually, the numbers don't pan out. So something I encourage people to do is to take an action a week to figure this out before your book launch so you know the types of things that might work because you've experienced it. Okay. So the philosophy here is, because you obviously you do need scaling. I mean, authors don't want to sell 12 books a year. They want to sell 100,000 books a year. So you need some amount of scaling. Is the philosophy you're talking about here, and that, I don't know if this is an expression that works in America, 
look after the pennies because the pounds will look after themselves. Do you have that expression, look after the cents because the dollars look after themselves? So if you, you work on the small bits and pieces, the, the sincerity, uh, the, the, the outreach, talking to people, being generous, being interested and, and outgoing, then the bigger things start to look after themselves. Yeah, I Is actually... That philosophy? I, yeah, it, it's a good point. I've never heard that expression before. I do think that that is actually what does scale. Because I think that, and you know, the podcast is a good is a good example too, where when you have these real connections with people, they start recommending you to other people, and they start doing these things where that is actually what scales. And sometimes you don't know how it happens. You're like, how did they hear about me? How did I get that? And again, this is something I noticed from being very New York centric, as I have plenty of friends who write for big magazines or big newspapers. Look at the bylines in these newspapers. And, you know, wow, wow did, why did they, you know, for one of these Sunday features when they followed an author around for a day, what's the life of this author like on a typical Sunday? You start noticing circles. You start noticing that they pull from the same pool of authors that they trust, that some of the people um, for the actual, for, for actually writing some of the guest articles, that for people they feature, you notice, oh, I know some of these people. So he knows her and she knows her and she knows her. That's probably how they found that author that these relationships that don't feel like they scale because they're one-on-one -on -one are actually the things that actually does scale because this is how word of mouth marketing works. And I think the alternative is I've talked to so many authors who will say, I've won this award and that award. And I have, I mean, literally I've had authors say I have 80,000 followers. And I'm like, okay, cool. You know, can you tell me just a, a, just anything, just to give me a sense of like, Tell me about like a typical follower. Like, why does someone follow you? What are they engaged with? Oh, I don't know. You know, because they tried to scale first. They bought those followers. They outsourced it to someone else who's kind of tweeting for them. And you have these big numbers and you have no insight about who these people are, what engages them. And then the problem is that when you get really nitty gritty with marketing plans and outreach, you don't know where to even go because you don't know how to talk to them. You don't have anywhere to start. Whereas if you have 20 people who love your work and you say, okay, what should I do? Um, if you have like an inner circle like that, well, suddenly you have a lot of ideas. You have a lot of people who are going to spread that to people. And I find that that is really where word of mouth marketing starts. And I don't know if this is totally true, but there's a phrase, you know, the only marketing that works is word of mouth marketing. And of course, whatever you and Mark teach, but um, <laughs> we'll add that in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the other one, half of all advertising works, we just don't know which half. Yes, um, I love that one. The old one as well. Um, so I'm also thinking about authors and, you know, I'm writing a book myself and that idea that you talk to people and they give you feedback and, and you follow, that in itself is a bit of a step for some authors. They kind of are kind of part of you. And I say this to myself, part of me doesn't want to hear. It's not for me. Oh, I, I didn't like the way that worked. You know, you have to have a mental jump just working with an editor on this. The idea of, of basically crowdsourcing your next project is a little bit scary for some people. I don't view it as crowdsourcing the work itself. Your writing is your writing. I think that when you look at the idea of publishing, publishing is a business um, in the way a lot of people look at it with book sales and authorship. And maybe separately from that, your identity as a writer is an identity. Um, I'm a huge advocate for people who want to write or make sculpture or write, po you know, do poetry or photography, and they don't want to publish. They do it for art's sake. I think that that is a beautiful and wonderful thing, and I encourage people to do that. If you want to have a career or hobby as an author, and you don't have collaborators, you don't have other authors you know, then it's not really going to be a profession. And I don't mean a full time profession, but even a hobby. Um, you need to have that kind of interaction. You need people who will hold you accountable. You need people giving you feedback. You need people who will help you along the way. Every professional author, and again, you can define that really broadly, I know they have that because otherwise you are lonely, you're scared, you're grasping at straws. So this is everything I think outside of creating the work itself. I do not think you need to crowdsource the actual work. It's when you describe that work. It's when you think about doing a marketing plan. It's when you think about, huh, I am a private person. How will I be public with this? How do you bridge that gap between not saying, well, you've got to become an extrovert. I mean, that's not the right answer. How do you do it in a way that gives you an identity and an experience where you're being strategic and also feels good? Um, and again, I think this is where the benefit of 
being in my 40s helps where I'll look back to those communities at a, a local club or a local bookstore, a local cafe, where there was a community around poetry. There was a community around music. There was a community around sculpture and art. And those people had to leave their house to be a part of that community. It wasn't spammy. No one came out there with their business card. It was a matter of being public. And that is inherently what publishing is. Yeah, the public in pub, in publishing. I hadn't thought about that before. Um, okay, so this is a, a fantastic sort of approach for people to think about. And there's a, I can't remember, it's probably a bank or someone very corporate, I think had an expression about um, thinking global, acting local or something like that. But it is sort of that. It's, it's basically look after the people in front of you. Um, and again, goes back to that other, other expression. Um, but to bring a little bit of corporate world into it and we talk a lot about how you know if you've got an instagram account there's no as you say just no point in building up an audience for the sake of it how is that going to help you and one of the things you we hear from people is that and it does sound very corporate you've got to be on brand so basically when you do all this stuff when you do talk to people it's got to be there's got to be some consistent message from you right that's going to support yeah um you so I think there's there's two sides to that. One is you want to focus people, and this is something I see a lot, where a writer is not good at saying that they're a writer, and they're not good at focusing people. So I mentioned earlier communication and trust. The communication side of it, you've got to get really clear about prioritizing what you do. I can't tell you how many writers I see. Their Twitter bio is um, husband, Mets fan, Tom Petty aficionado, accountant, thriller author. And it's like, wow, like you want, you're on Twitter to see it as a writer, but you put everything else first and you gave this list of things. So I do think that you want to be really clear about how you communicate what you do and putting that first and then thinking about, well, how can I share that in a way that's authentic? Well, I do a lot of research um, around my authorship. So let me write about that. I I live in Boston. I'm going to be a part of the Boston literary community. Let me share a little bit about that. I love other books that are in this genre. Let me illustrate that I buy these books, I support their authors. Because even writing about them, as the word you use, like it signals to other people that if I'm a thriller writer and I'm sharing books about thrillers, that's the same thing. Or if it's a TV show or a movie. I think the other end of it is that what actually engages people on social media is the really human stuff. Um, you know, the, the classic example I use is uh, my friend Kate, who works in publishing. And, you know, years ago, we we're just getting started on Twitter and she's doing publishing tweet, publishing tweet, publishing tweet, you know, and very middling response. And one day she's in um, the Whole Foods Market at 14th Street and a rat runs by her. And she gets right on Twitter and she's like, I've never seen so much engagement as I did with the rat tweet because everyone can kind of relate to the, the craziness of that situation. My friend Lori Richmond, who's a children's book illustrator, does this as well. She's very on brand on Instagram. She shares a lot about her art and the books coming out and her creative process. But um, late last year, her refrigerator broke. And it, you know, she lives in Manhattan, or she lives in Brooklyn. And the ordeal to get in a refrigerator that fit into her tiny apartment in Brooklyn, it was an ordeal. And she said, I've never gotten so much reply from people about this refrigerator and where to shop and how to fit it in and, and all of that process. So I do think there's the way, as you say, being very strategic, knowing what to wipe away, but then knowing how to be a human being and realizing that, like, you know, I mentioned Tom Petty had randomly and that connected with you. We're much more likely to say, oh, I'm going to stay, I'm going to follow him on social media. Maybe I'll connect with him in six months. Maybe I'll send him something because of that connection. And that really is what people want. They don't want to wake up every day and market. They want to wake up every day and fill their lives with interesting people and talk about things that they relate to. Yeah. You mentioned the Mets as well. Are you a Mets fan? Nope. No, Random okay. example. That Sorry. Would been, that would have been a third thing. I'm a Mets fan. Okay, look. See, now we can't um, be friends. <laughs> I'm going to, yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, um, I think that's absolutely right. And what I find really interesting following, because I've got a lot of friends who don't like Twitter. It's not their platform. Which is, I love Twitter. And I don't know if it's because I quite like politics and sports. And it's quite a niche area. So you can actually hear the real people in the middle of these things talking offhand. And you're absolutely right. You watch corporations trying to do it and getting it wrong. And it's hideous sometimes. And uh, and sometimes they accidentally get it right. And there's a good example of that going on at the moment with British Airways. So I'm a bit of a 
aviation geek. So British Airways, very corporate company, big Spanish corporation, uh, ironically for British Airways. And their corporate account has very slowly developed. But they've got three or four pilots and cabin crew who tweet as their as a pilot or a cabin crew, and they're brilliant. And they're just life and soul people. They love being in different cities around the world. Uh, one of them's massively interested in, in showing you little bits of the airplane and why they do this and how they fly. And it's the best publicity British Airways could get. And yet I know from being in that environment, there would have been a lot of sucking teeth at the beginning. So, well, this could all go wrong. And this is not on brand. It's not going through corporate. We're not going to, we're just not going to do this. And it may, it may have taken this guy five years to persuade them, look, can I just tweet as a pilot? And it's the best publicity British Airways. It makes me want to fly even more on those planes with those people because it's human. And if we bring, I love that. And if bring that back to an author, if we think about, you know, what is the process of writing like? I've heard plenty of oh, people don't want to know how the sausage is made. And it's like, sometimes they don't, but oftentimes they do. They're fascinated that one human being can create a whole universe. Um, I interviewed author Joseph Finder recently, and he's written books and he's been, he's had his books made into movies. And he said, you know, I've been on set with Morgan Freeman and that, and it's like 500 people there to make this movie for a book that I wrote by myself. Mm. And I think that the, the British Airways example is really great to think about, well, what is it that's interesting here? You know, because it could be the writing process, it could be the research, it could be the, it could be um, the whodunit. So you write mysteries, you're not going to write about that, but it's like people watch TV, they watch movies, there's classic movies. Like, what's that whodunit moment? I can write about that. Uh, maybe there's something about, um, you know, I've got typewriters behind me. You know, the vintage instruments, what is a writer? And there's something uh, something I follow, Danny Shapiro on Instagram and Twitter. And, you know, she gets very deep with these things. She'll, she'll take a tone, this resonant, deep, almost spiritual tone, because that's what resonates with her and her readers. And it's not exactly what her book's about at all, but it resonates with the tone of what her books are about. Yeah. So being genuine, being sincere and enjoying connecting. And I do think you can spreadsheet this out. You can actually create a spreadsheet of saying like, what are the five things I could write about? And you could say writing process. Well, what does that look like? Uh, I guess it's my daily practice. So I can maybe every time I write, I'll create a little graphic or I'll have a typewriter there and I'll do a photo on Instagram. And you can say, uh, you know, how, you know, what's the editing process or vintage things like you can really do a whole mind map to figure these things out. If you're like, I don't know what to share on Twitter. My book doesn't come out for a year. Um, so I do think you can also be strategic. It's not just this vague word of being authentic because authentic is a little too broad. And, and sometimes authenticity means, you know, people just want to watch sports for nine hours in a row. And that doesn't really help when you're trying to yeah. figure out a Twitter strategy for your author life. <laughs> You can be too honest sometimes. Yes. Yeah. Dan, it's been brilliant talking to you. You better tell people where they can find you. And I'll give the URL again as well to get the PDF in a moment. Sure. Uh, I'm at wegrowmedia.com. And then on Twitter and Instagram and all the social media, I'm at, at Dan Blank, D-A-N-B-L-A-N-K. Excellent. And you're going to put together this PDF uh, yeah. of handy tips to get started. And we will give that away at uh, selfpublishingshow.com forward slash connect. Dan, it's been uh, great talking to you. We've found a lot of common interests, apart from the fact that you're yet to be converted to the glory of uh, New York's most losing Major League Baseball team in history, uh, the Mets. But, you know, there's time. When you get to 52, maybe you will have discovered them. Yes. Did you just not follow baseball at all. I, I don't. My family does, but I don't. There you go. Okay, well, uh, I've got some work to do. Good. Dan, thank you so much indeed for joining us today. It's been brilliant. Thank you. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello, Mark. Oh, dear. Speak now. <laughs> oh, um, dear. You are occasionally human, which is nice as well. Uh, is this something that you think about? I know it is something you think about because I read your emails and I know you write them as a personable person. Absolutely. If, if, if you've taken uh, either of our courses, you know that's kind of fundamental to my whole philosophy is to is to reach reach out to readers. I hate saying that, reach out. It's to talk yeah. to readers. Are you in the four tops? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, it's to talk to them like just like you know you're having a conversation with a friend. That's kind of it boils down to the way I look at it, and um, and I think readers, anyone really can can tell when someone has written an email, written correspondence with 
that in mind rather than approaching it in a formal fashion. I see lots of emails from uh, writers who whose lists I'm on, um, and you can tell when they're working too hard and and they they don't have that informal touch, and it's it's pretty it can be a little cold and it feels a little bit. Um, inauthentic and and it doesn't make me want to uh, continue to buy their books sometimes so it, it's a fairly simple change that you can make to um, your correspondence with your readers but it can have a really big big impact and make a big difference to your career yeah and one of the key things is and we talked about this in the interview is that y- you are what you're selling effectively people are investing in an author we all like our favorite authors and we say that we say we like our favorite author we don't say we like those books I suppose you might do, but really it's an author who you become attached to. And that's different from selling a car or running an airline or anything like that. And so you can get away with more corporate language there, but we shouldn't be. We should be talking to people one-on-one. So that resource, again, that we talked about in the interview, selfpublishingshow.com forward slash connect is the place to go to download the PDF, five ways to immediately connect with readers. Because relationships sell books, Mark. They do, yes, I, exactly. No, it's a, it's a good tip and, and you'd be well advised to remember that when you finally release your book sometime in the next i've, I've had to interrupt a writing session to record this uh record this interview i'm going back it's all happening down in salisbury in my uh, book now ah. just outside the cathedral i knew it'd end up there eventually okay good and on that Novichok bombshell, let's say uh, goodbye for this week. Don't forget you can support us uh, at patreon.com forward slash self-publishing show where you will immediately be enrolled as a student in the self-publishing formula university and have a lot of resources immediately available to you. And we're building more of those in the future. Don't forget our mini podcast, son of podcast or daughter of podcast uh, on Wednesday live at Facebook, probably around 4 p.m. UK, we think, which is what 8 a.m. in Los Angeles, a bit later in the day three hours later in the day in new york and uh, if you want to be on that your opportunity to be a guest on daughter of podcast that's it thank you very much indeed mark uh, plans for the weekend um well, i've been running around all week with my daughter in sorry with my son in low stuff because they're at least a holidays now for for an effing month um, so <laughs> i've done practically nothing this week so today has been a fairly busy day and then at the weekend um i think i'll be i'll be parenting and then um, i'm back again in lower stuff on monday with my daughter this time for another week so um lots of driving 10 hours i've got five hours driving yesterday with my son and he wouldn't listen he wouldn't watch his ipad he just wanted to talk to daddy and uh superb after 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 i don't know 50 miles of five-year-old nonsense i was about ready to crash into the central reservation but anyway we're still here my uh, my favourite conversation with my son, who I think was nine or ten, and we were driving through Norway to go skiing, long trip through Norway. It's just me and him, and he spent the entire journey saying, I know there's a rude word that begins with C. What is it? And I said, I'm not talking to you about that. Your sister should not have spoken to you and said there's another rude... There's a re- it's a really rude word. It begins with C. What is it? And on and on and on. He almost got called it towards uh, <laughs> he, <laughs> yeah, almost, sure. he almost found out exactly what that word was one time <laughs> we got to a, a sauna. Uh, there you go. Well, these are lovely moments we'll treasure for the rest of our lives. So, yes, I'm told that's true. Yes. <laughs> good. Well, look, have a good time in low stuff next week. We'll be on the podcast again next Friday. Until then, have a great week reading and a great week writing and a great week selling. Doing all three of those things. Added another reading in. And that's it. It's goodbye from him. And it's goodbye from me. Goodbye. Goodbye. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing, so get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.